Security Expert Talk. And even today, and for this episode, I have really the pleasure and honor to have five excellent experts in the field of identity. And this is the topic as well for the current episode. We want to talk about identity and what is the purpose of identity towards everything we are doing in the digital space. Of course, identity has a strong relation to security, uh, even to safety. And I think it's tied to so many things. Um, but normally with this talk, um, first of all, I want to introduce to the expert experts. It's Lorna here. Hello, Lorna. Hello. I have Jeff as an expert. Hello. And I have Rob. So, and, and today it's a European episode. The last episode was rather global. It was Singapore, US, uh, <laughs> Germany, whatever. Today we are a rather European community. So, but it's good because I think Europe has been always ahead on several issues and topics. And I think Europe is as well going ahead on digital identities, hopefully. And uh, first of all, I want to start with a little bit, uh, let's say a little bit about identity more on a physical layer. It was uh, like Eric Erickson said, um, in social jungle of human existence, there's no feeling of being alive without a sense of identity. So this is made for humans. And my first question to the more, let's say, because I know Rob is a more the guy who is inside of the philosophy stuff. Well, if this is for humans, uh, when, uh, how do we see it for artificial intelligence, internet of things and everything which is connected to digital? Well, I think you should ask the engineers and then ask if they're human. <laughs> <laughs> because... Because they they they, br they brought this all on us. Sort of they introduced, let's say, objects and machines, and um, I would say that's exactly the moment where uh, it starts when um, when we have a fully analog world with um, and a virtual world that's uh, that's really distinguishable. So you have your smartphones and your machines and your uh, tablets and your computers on the one hand. And the input and output of those machines stay inside of those machines. So you have a virtual world quite apart from the analog world. And in the analog world, you indeed have humans. And these humans are still not chipped. And their objects are still then not tagged. And their machines still have no processors. And their lamps and washing machines have no processors. Um, but now... This is, so that quote was interesting in, because we could still really the, distinguish between humans and machines and because their output and input stayed uh, apart. But now from let's say 2000 with the cloud and with the internet of things, uh, this is no longer the case. And the, this virtual world is bringing input into what was once analog, analog objects. So for example, a connected car that you're driving is going to act not on your input, but on the input it gets from the cloud somehow or some other kind of devices. So um, I would say that quote is, is really uh, speaking to, um, to the problems that we are now facing. I like the quote because it has something about existence. You know, identity is tied to existence. That's, that's the main thing. And this quote was made for humans. And now to me, Lorna, like, um, it sounds to me, okay, identity seems something which is uh, really basic. It's the basic, let's say, agreement you need for existence. So as you are deep in this kind of user experience stuff and, 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 and thinking about the applications we are facing, um, how do you see identity is tied there? Uh, I really like that quote, particularly say the sense of identity. And in a way, it had already implies that it's something that's not fixed and it's not something that's um it's something that is more fluid and more changing in particular when you're coming from the user experience side experience is something that's very much influenced by other people that you're interacting with the environment that you're in and and there we see if you're working on the user experience of these new digital identities this this kind of tension between the technological world which in a way wants to almost uh, define very fixed aspects and elements and characteristics, and particularly from a security perspective, 
And yet in the analog world, it's, it's anything but fixed. And in fact, um, there's even quite a lot of, um, in the UX world, backlash against creating personas, which is sort of um, creating these identities and elements of people that you're designing for when we realize that individuals will change throughout the day, throughout their life, um, they will change their role and they will change their sense of identity. And you actually need to be able to design for that. So we have these wonderful discussions with the technical teams is how can the technology also meet these needs of being able to change my identity, change the way that I represent myself, the way that I sense myself when I'm in a particular environment. Yeah, cool. And I like, we're still talking about the human aspects because you're talking <laughs> my identity, I, and so on. But, but Jeff, I mean, you're on the crypto, let's say you're more on the technical. I, I see you're more on the technical space because you're, you're doing this kind of technical software engineering and stuff like that. And you're as well, let's say part of projects as well in, in cryptography and blockchain and stuff like that. So, but on what kind of identities um, you're working on? Yeah. Is it still human? Well, hearing uh, this talk about identity and existence and mixing that up with what people call digital identity, which is actually just a bunch of data, in the best case, about that says something about you as a human. But often um, they are quite formal pieces of information and not really saying who you are or what you really are. Uh, so to say, really, this is my identity, uh, this is a gross underestimation. So uh, it is really a challenge uh, to represent something of your identity in a digital form. And we end up usually with a simplification. Simplification and for really uh, limited purposes for, to use that digital identity, uh, really to interact with machines. Uh, with, with apps, huh? uh, primarily most people just with apps. Uh, most of us don't uh, do in space flight or whatever, something like that, but just uh, interact with our social media and things like that. So we are we are even dealing with uh, having issues with the SN, with the basics of that. So not even touching a whole, the whole life cycle, if you want, from, from, from birth to, to death, uh, uh, but just simple how to represent yourself digitally. And uh, we, have, we already see that uh, we struggle with the technical side of that and not so much uh, that it's not possible, but that everyone's doing something on their own. Even we are doing something our way and we, we think that we... Uh, we use uh, some standards or something, but uh, in fact, we, 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 we want to bring our own version of this identity. And so there's still a lot of work to do there um, and still needs to mature. Uh, and then we're a long way, I think, from, uh, um, from real existence to represent real existence in a digital identity. Yes, and, and when I was... I mean, I try, I was reading a little bit about the history of identities, of course, like the history of passports, you know, what was the first passport? I think even in the Bible, you have the first evidence that when the Jews went from Egypt, you know, they need a document to show who they are. Um, yeah. um, it seems to me that the purpose, the first purpose of identity was always tied to someone like traveling, like you want to control people are who's leaving from one territory to another one. And now as we are, all of us are still in lockdown situation. And we, we see that the travel, you know, we are actually rebooting travel. And I think a lot of the discussion now about identity and what, can, what information we can tie to identity and why we need a digital identity is again, the purpose of travel. Like how can we get uh, tie information about, let's say, Corona or other epidemic stuff, uh, how can we get control on it? And by that we need uh, somehow identities, digital identities who is tied on, which is on the one side good and on the other side also a little bit fear. A lot of, it brings also a lot of fears of, of, of misusing and stuff like that. So like, I don't know, Rob, uh, what do you think? I mean, it's always like it's a, it's a, it's a dual use technology 
good and bad uh, is always in behind. But to me, it seems like when the Jewish went went from Egypt, it was always, always also the document was a dual use document. So, <laughs> well, yeah, well, in, in terms of history of identity, you can start a bit earlier. Uh, in uh, in China, where the first emperor, 287 BC, started the registration system of people. And um, this was a particular one that says that um, if you were doing something that you shouldn't, were not supposed to do, then the whole street was punished. So it was also a, a kind of a local, kind of um, a localized aspect sort of brought into this. But this was the first thing that the emperor in China did was registration, um, registration process. And this is very helpful to understand uh, how the Chinese sort of, let's say, bubble um, was able to get built and how Chinese people uh, um, react and have certain ideas about um, how they interact with authority and how they interact with, with, with and how they feel about um, particular types of tracing and tracking kind of situations because it was, it was always part of a, of, a, of a history and culture. Now in Europe, it starts with Napoleon. And our European registration of people is actually 2,000 years later than the Chinese. So it's about 1800s of where we sort of go there. Uh, and sort of this is very, this is indeed, the key was basically travel, but travel then has to do with where you are, where you live, where you belong to. So it's basically about power and, uh, and, and territory and territorial control. So the notion of this, type of identity as we know it in terms of documents has always been tied to the notion of control and the notion of, of power. And if you bring up the, vi the virus, I think this is exactly kind of the, um, the moment where we see that we need a different view on, on identity, right? So here we have a virus, and this virus is basically going to kill or can kill anyone. It distributes insecurity. That's what I like about the virus. So it, it can sort of target anyone. Of course, younger, younger ones and younger people are sort of a little bit children are a little bit exempt, but still. So, and then we have um, this smartphone. And so you would, you would seem, it would seem logical that people will say, track me, trace me, uh, enable all your functionality to enable me to stay safe from this deadly virus. And what are we seeing? We're actually seeing the opposite. So we're seeing that um, there's a huge kind of pushback against people. And this is very strange to me because most people, when I look around outside my window, they have this smartphone in their hands. So they have something in their hands that they don't fully trust. This is, this is quite interesting. And psychologically, it can be it's quite strange. We need psychologists to sort of look into this because how can you actually have something in your hand. But then these people say, let's say most majority of citizens, they don't really trust state actors with all of their private data in their apps. And they also don't really trust these commercial companies. And so they have this kind of smartphone, which they're on basically 20 hours of 24 day, but they still don't think it's a good environment, even when there's a deadly virus around. Now that shows to me that identity management harnessed by the state in terms of passports or harnessed by commercial actors in terms of one click entrances to new ecosystems, which you do with your Facebook or LinkedIn or sort of all these accounts is something that people essentially still at this moment in time, even with a deadly virus around, which would make you feel happy to be tracked and traced and then you can be tested and you can be safe, still not happening. And this I think inspired us, all of us, to, um, to take this, this new notion of self-sovereign identity where you take identity, not just control your own data streams, but you control your identity, the very first issuer of credentials that you want to be staged with as you into your own hands. And um, so I think it's especially the virus that shows that... Um, that we have all the apparatus in place and it's perfectly possible and still people don't seem to trust it. And that, that sort of makes it very clear to me that there's something wrong 
people don't trust their states and if people don't trust their companies when they're potentially dying and when there's a tool that could potentially help them and they still don't want that app installed, then there's something fundamentally wrong, I would say, with the notion of identity today. It's good. Uh, Rob, you said self-sovereign identity, which is an important point. Uh, anyone in the round uh, would like to explain what is a self-sovereign identity? Because I can, anyone has the, yeah. can, can do it? Jeff? Yes, uh, I think uh, it's pretty simple. It's uh, like when you go back to first your traveling example and the need to basically control by authorities, uh, you know, wherever you go, whatever you move, whatever you do. So you track every single uh, person uh, and the aspect of authorization that you know from the security world that has something like, who is the author here? Yeah? It is usually uh, the way we uh, recently uh, got, uh, got, uh, in, got in contact with it is that someone else gives has, is the author, like uh, an Android or, a, or, or an Apple device or a Facebook or the government. So they are the authors, if you want, the, that gives us an identity. And with self sovereign identity, we basically turn it completely around. Then we say, we are the first, we as humans, we as individuals are creating that uh, capability. Uh, and uh, we can prove by means of cryptography, with, uh, the user would know it, but technically behind the scenes, they're using cryptography to prove really that you are in control of your identity because you are having the keys in your hands. And so literally, the keys to do the cryptography. With that, you create the digital identities. And with that, you can log on to multiple services and say, okay, this is me, but I created it myself. So that's where the self-sovereignty comes from. Yeah. It uh, sounds to me, sorry, it sounds to me something like, okay, there's a gatekeeper. Normally there's a gatekeeper who's creating an identity, you know, in, in the past, in the internet for every process. Like if you go to an online shop, you're creating an identity. If you go... If you go to, to your social media account, you're creating an identity. So there are always gatekeepers who are creating your identity and they keep control they keep, over your identity, yeah. isn't it? They give the impression that you create it, but, but basically what they do is they exploit it. So they create actually the real identity. You put something against it so that you recognize yourself, like your name or the photo, but they, they are exploiting it they are really using it for their purposes, right? So it's the reverse that we try to do. Keep that control back to ourselves. So uh, uh, it seems to be a little thing, but it's a big thing uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, the, how you really control uh, your traces in the world, uh, the, your digital traces, your steps that you make when you, when you travel digitally. Um, on the other hand, uh, you, uh, I, I wanted also to say something about that traveling and that uh, fact that there is also, let's say, migration, yeah? uh, where there's migrants are typically people that uh, are, are, let's say, driven out of their countries and have nothing. And uh, they are very, very, very weak citizens because they have... Uh, they are really in fully in the hands of those authorities that, that call the migrants and that they register these people. So even they uh, do not have initially the capabilities of saying this is me because is this my history of, of, of documents or so that I can prove who I am. They even got, got that. So we are talking from a luxury position, uh, saying, okay, we're self-sovereign. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're in a good position to prove who we are. I mean, but still we have to recognize that a lot of people around in the world who even haven't got that, that basic uh, way of saying who they are or where they come from or proof, you know. Let's say this, I mean, you can, you can be a taxi driver today. You had a diploma of, of a physicist or a PhD in, in Iran or, or Iraq and it has no value when you arrive here at the borders without the proof. 
Yeah. And so you need to be taxi driver. That's a really shame. Two, two, two issues where I think about is like, um, first, if we talk about digital identities or identity as well, I mean, there's one issue like um, identity chef and, and cloning identity. So the misuse of identity. So how can we protect ourselves from that? Our identity will be cloned and stolen and used by others. So uh, Lorna, what do you see if, if, if you work with your people and, 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 and people together? Um, what are the solutions for that? Um, and do we, do we really need it? I mean, that's not a question like we can say, well, we don't need to care about it, but what do you think about it? Oh, no, we definitely need to care about it. But I think also maybe connecting that to, to what Jeff was saying and Rob just about uh, you know, the fundamentals of self-sovereign identity. And I know that there are a lot of um, technological developments. We're working together to try and build that bridge between the, you know, the extremely, um, interesting developments when it comes to cryptography and um, distributed ledger, etc. But one fundamental challenge is that we're still trying to place the existing paradigm of non self sovereign identity, as in the passport system, the, um, you know, the federated nationalized form of identity, which is actually as Rob points out, uh, is a form of power of control. We're trying to put that into a self sovereign identity, um, you know, wallet. And yet the identity itself is not self-sovereign. And I mean, obviously that's not something that we're going to be able to change overnight, but we can, we can see the impact that that has. And while we're maybe creating and working on an infrastructure that is usable and prepared for true self-sovereign identity, what we're doing is we're putting a non-self-sovereign identity into a self-sovereign identity architecture. On the plus side of that, I think as you were saying, that this enables us to control our own identities as they have been created for us by different um, organizations and governments. Um, and that means that we will have better insight into whether identity is being used, abused, uh, misused. So that's a positive thing. And we can also get a bit more insight into how our identity is being connected to us and connected to other forms of data and forms of um, conclusion, insight and control. So it's, it's a great step in the right direction, but it's definitely, I think what we're working on, we're calling it SSI, but it's not. It's actually a framework in preparation for a potential new way of actually being truly able to create our own identities and meaning. And uh, like Rob, because uh, oh, what if, do we need, or do we need the ability to hide our identity anymore? It's like, because currently, obviously I see it's, it's already hard to hide the identity. I mean, they're from law, there, there are some several aspects from law where you're, not, where you're not allowed to hide your identity. But as well, we see with the technology providers and stuff like that, we have no ability to hide our identity. And on the other side, we need privacy as well. So um, the first big question is like, uh, shall we hide our identity? Yes or not? Is there a need for hiding our identity? And the second one, is there any chance for hiding our identity anymore? Yeah, I mean, these are these are these are the key questions. So, so I mean, just going back to your gatekeeper um, point. So, fourteen fifty two is is the Gutenberg Press, and um, there's about eighty million people in Europe around that time, and. Uh, Power is kings and queens and priests. And if they want, they can make anyone literate by 30, 40 years. So by 1500, Europe could have been literate. As we know, it doesn't happen. And the first public library is uh, 1918 in Holland. And first free public book lending is also 1918 in the UK. So we have the ability to distribute learning tools for free. We can print them. But it's not happening. So these... Um, vested interest that, of course, realize that knowledge is power, uh, don't really want to distribute it uh, equally and freely. And they start stalling it and they build their gatekeepers. And the gatekeepers are the institutions that we live in now, which is representative democracy, schools, experts, teachers, sort of all these, all these positions are gatekeeping positions. And so what the internet did especially was remove all these gatekeepers. And that's why we're here now. So Bob Gahn, Vin Cerf, they, 
they actually made a very simple protocol for machines to talk to each other. So the whole point of the distributing tools of education in, in the book was to get people to talk to each other on shared knowledge and shared data, but that data was excluded. And it was, um, and if you ask, can I read a book in 1600, you basically, you burn. <laughs> they burned a lot of people just for asking, can I read a book in my language? And, um, and if you ask it in 1900, you're probably in jail because you're an anarchist or a communist or something like that. But um, so in comes the internet, 50s, 60s, 70s, and it basically says pass on the packet. So the TCPIP protocol removes all gatekeepers. It says pass on a packet, the router, the modem, the computer, doesn't ask where it goes, where it goes to, doesn't ask where it comes from, doesn't ask what's in this packet. It just passes on the packet. That's how it was able to, it's a virus. That's how it was able to spread so fast. The, of course, this was all code. And then in the 90s, Tim Berners-Lee puts WW HTML on top of this. So he puts speed on speed. He simply says, pass on the link. In that in these days, we had tell Ned, Ted Nelson with Xanadu, we said, Ted, you can, Tim, you cannot do this because you will get fake news in a decade. And of course we have that. But Tim said, I'm, not, I just, I just, I'm just gonna do this anyway. I'm just gonna put HTML on top of the TCP IP and this is why we're in now. Um, this is still talking about sort of standalone devices. We're now moved to internet of things in which basically any object has some form of capability to become part of this network. So this is like air. How can you hide from air? How can you even think about building anonymization type of tools when identity is or fu fundamentally has become a process? But identity now is only partly how you want to stage yourself. The other part is what your objects are saying about you. And we're talking now with computers, with routers, with, so I might try to hide myself as an individual, <laughs> even like put my screen on black, but all my devices around me here, my phone or everything is, is sort of building a, a kind of a profile for me as we do this, as we speak. And the, the third thing that's happening as we speak is that behavior is becoming very much um, independently of our actions, a part of our identity, because we're being fully tracked and traced in all kinds of cameras in a grid, in, in whatever we go outside, sort of anyway. So how would you even think to want to become anonymous? The only thing I can think when I look at a situation like this is, how can we take over the situation? How can we take over the full imaginary of the situation? And that's what I've been trying to do for the past 20 years. Realizing that if I wanted to even make myself sort of invisible in this environment, I would, this would be, this would be totally impossible. You would not have to breathe. Okay, another And, concept would be if, if you can't be invisible, clone yourself as much as possible. Well, that's sort of, Part, I think, of this uh, of the ideas that um, that we are having is is can be sort of construed like that, where you don't have one identity, but you have thousands sort of of disposable identities in, in a particular way. But but rather than than having that as a kind of question or answer, I would rather sort of shift the whole situation to um, to accountability to really think how is it possible that we have millions of people on the streets with a smartphone in their hands all of the time, not trusting any of the actors who are surrounding that device, still using it. What kind of schizophrenia is going around in these people? And how is it possible that this situation is actually now sort of How is it possible that it has come to this and people not, not fundamentally wondering about this? Now, I think they are now starting to wonder about it. And then my take on this would be, um, since all of this connectivity is not going away, how can we make this trustable? How can we create a provable computing kind of environment? How can we get people to start trusting this kind of digital world and how can we uh, sort of um, how can we enable them 
to, um, to be full actors, uh, instead of trying to have them think about how can I deconnect or decouple, or because really that's impossible. It's not one place in the world you can go where, the, where that connectivity isn't there. It's, it's even. I think there are places in the world where you can go unless. No, it's not uh, even in deep water, Mirko. They've got <laughs> they've got sensors. They've got sensors. It's so deep you cannot dive there. <laughs> there a, will be trust me grid. there are still some places in the world where you, where you have no connections but uh lorna just uh like because i mean i totally agree on 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 many things you say on, on some particular i will maybe disagree but uh in terms of i totally agree that the identity is something i mean it's something essential that even the digital identity will become something essential to me it will become something high valuable because it's my identity so and now the question is i in terms of trust i don't want to share my high value identity with everybody with every services like for example if i use once a time uh, a e-scooter in a city you know and i need to log in and to and do the authentication for this for this e-scooter on the city to drive on it Of course, because it's only a one-time action in my life with this asset where I had to share, share my identity. I don't want to give my high valuable identity to let's say a Grab e-scooter hardware, which is outdated after a few weeks and even to an e-scooter startup, which will be away, blown away uh, in six months. So what is then the answer on this like if you say the identity is the core of everything it's it will become the core of everything how can we protect the high value identity and then uh what do we do with all these actors we have to interact only once once in our life and which are low trust i mean lorna is there something like well i mean i it's it's great to hear you positioning it like that, framing it like that, because that's ultimately um, the work that we're doing. It's it's looking at identity in the way of it being um, a core characteristic of interaction. So rather than, I think maybe we sort of come from the idea of this identity being an object oriented thing, you know, it's my identity, it's me, I am uh, one unit. And that's probably, be, you know, maybe also inspired by the more federated view of identity. And I log into my Google account, it's one thing. But now what you're talking about is much more coming down to the essence of what our identity is, is what we use it for. It's for um, making a connection and that can be a high value connection and interaction, or it can be you know, a relatively fleeting low value one. And in that case, indeed, why do we use our incredibly heavily laden, very, very sort of privacy sensitive identity for a very low um, value transaction where neither party actually needs to know they don't need to know my date of birth my address and how many people in my family and where you know where i was born they just need to know am i good enough to pay the for this service and um can we have a nice pleasant interaction and then will you come back again because we trust each other and actually um and it's interesting because it's very much um culturally dependent and that's one of the things that we've hit across and as rob was saying we're, we're working um, I think very much in sort of European framework at the moment, but we've got a lot of people in the community from the international and you'll see there the way that identity in the relationship to communication transaction from an international context varies enormously. And so that's another sort of another side of the picture as to the value of our, our identities. And I think what we're looking at now is how to bridge the social cultural aspect of identities and communication and transaction with the technological framework that can enable that. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, you have an idea on doing that? Because the last word was yeah. te technological framework. Well, that's <laughs> a good bridge to me. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that, Lorna. I want to go one step back when, uh, when uh, uh, Rob was talking about packages from one to the other, and then putting HTTP on top of that at, uh, by Berners-Lee. And everyone was listening in the meantime. And uh, some, some bigger or uh, smarter parties were capturing all that data and they were doing the building of their profile. So they know more about you than yourself. I mean, those who are able to track all the packets and build actually an identity. And the thing is that identity is only used for commercialization of yourself. And they make really big bucks out of it. 
Uh, so, uh, I mean, Google, I'm talking Google uh, initially, and uh, then afterwards came Facebook, and they did it in, inside their own world. But, but Google still does it uh, around the world. And what they do is they, they, they really sell that data. And uh, you were talking about the scooter. Why aren't, are they asking so much information? Well, that's because only, only what you pay is not where they live by. They can charge much less. They live by the, the, what they capture from you and they resell that data and they get more from it. So if they gave some, so some data they captured from you, they get some, some value in return. So who is not benefiting? Are we getting a service? Yes, but we're not benefiting from this value that, uh, that is built from your identity. So that's what we really want to change. First, when we communicate, we don't want to have anyone listening to that, which we don't want to listen. So if you decide you want Google to listen in, you can, you can have to make that decision consciously. Now it's not. People are using their smartphones. They have no clue what's going on behind it. And they, they don't really care because they don't see it, they don't feel it. And you gave the, the example of proximity tracing, Rob, where people are being called now on the phone and that's very direct and they ask you, can you give us your name? Can you give us who you contacted? And then people start realizing, whoa, what are they doing? Because it's very direct, someone talking to you. When this happens on your phone, nobody asks the question, who are you, what are you doing, and so forth. But it's done automatically. So we want to turn that around and say, just start from the basics, the conversation between two people, keep that safe, keep that between us. Nobody needs to listen into that when he doesn't need to. And that's the basis really to start from. And then we can extend it to those service providers you mentioned, like the scooter, and say, listen, you only need now to know who I am. And so you cannot combine the whole the dots and make the money out of us unless you cut in a piece for me, which I have a right to basically. Why can't we as citizens have a piece of that pie? A sort of a data, uh, sort of a data uh, money or something or, or dividend. Yeah, but the question, the answer on that question is rather easy because no one wants wants you to have the dish. I mean, that's, sure, that's sure. Rather, I know that. I know the answer, but uh, I mean, someone needs to stand up for the citizens and say we want to do it differently for you, and that's what you want to do. Now, this, if I may, there's this. I think there's a balancing sort of argument in the middle that if you really look deep into why is this data being gathered and why are these profiles being made. Primarily, the biggest um, reason is for commercial reasons, so for advertising, the current business model. But actually, it's in advertisers' best interest for, to actually engage us in that process. So rather than um, doing it in, in such an exploitative way, and actually, if you um, set up enough blockers, actually, the, the profile they build is not exactly as accurate as they might like to believe. But if it was more open and negotiative and trusting, then it might be that I can actually put my profile out there that I want somebody to approach me with a commercial offer. Cool. And it's interesting that it's, there's no, there doesn't seem to be enough moves towards actually engaging the, you know, the end target in that whole process. Correct. It's to me like just a fu funny story that was about facial recognition. So all we know is facial, of course, all on facial recognition is about identity. I mean, that's the purpose of it. Of it. I mean, see a face like what is the who's the identity let's say it's it's one of the most important applications so there was a story in behind like what is how reliable are the current facial recognition uh, algorithms mm. and the result was um, uh, it has been tested with faces of politicians and there was a high false positive of uh, identifying them with mugshots of criminals so oh, yes i saw that <laughs> and I mean, let's, yeah, but it shows something like, oh, what will happen if we keep the, if we keep the, if we hand over the identity issues to algorithms? I mean, that's, I think, an interesting question. If, how to, if algorithms will create the identities and will associate the identities, we need to live with a situation where we, where maybe because algorithms are not super, super error free, super brains. Um, uh, how can we deal with that? Because if something is 
is in this terms like a cent, let's say the central controlled identity will build up on and, and are running up on this kind of algorithm supports. I mean, the data will getting more and more, let's say um, there will be more and more errors in the data, isn't it? So are we running with the existing way how we, how we deal identities and connect identities in a way we can't even will not, we can't use identity anymore uh, because there will be too too much errors connected in the system. Well, I think sort of um, the, um, in 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 the direction that we're going, there will be op it's, it's, it's going to be open source. So all these algorithms will also be open source. So now these algorithms are closed, and we can indeed not really. But in in the argument in the framework that we're building. All the elements um, are going to be able to be tested and tried, and and the code is going to be going to be open for to build build on and, and make better. So what, if I pick up on what Lona was saying, then I always saw the Internet of Things as um, as a way for me as a person to get really good feedback on my health, um, to get the best resource allocation in my home, um, to align all my other service providers with global and local kind of situations and to build data-driven governance away from ego whims and all the things that we say play, see playing out now in the United States with, with ego politics and greed and all, this, all these things. It's a lack of data-driven governance. So that's basically how I see it. Then I would also think that most citizens would actually welcome such a situation where they're not governed by ego grim whims or all these kinds of things but some kind of data driven real time uh, governance uh, that would give them good feedback on on their actions and all the kind of things and deals that they want to want to do that's that's what i say is it, is, is the best this is also a situation i think that Vin Cerf and Bob Kahn were trying to engender with this pip with the internet itself now, of course, the first iterations were taken up by people like Jobs and Gates and Gates closed down open source development of Word, as we know, and built, built, uh, built a Word on WordPad, it closed down with his letter to the open source community uh, in the 70s. Uh, Jobs basically ripped off Xerox Spark of anything that was kind of useful. And Mark Zuckerberg called his first four users of Facebook dumb fucks. And so, so these are the kinds of people that are actually built this kind of huge ecosystems. I mean, to me, that's just saying, of course, the first iterations of this, to me, very transparent way of looking at resources, resource allocations, and, and, and how people are doing things in the world um, have been taken up by, um, by the, 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 the very ego-driven kind of sort of... Um, uh, th things and ways of, of doing that have built these large ecosystems. To me, that's just, it was just an iteration. And now people are seeing that the two models that have harnessed and harvested their identity, one being the national state, actually, as we speak in Europe, all nation states are now forced by law to open up their identity management to commercial actors. So for example, in Belgium, we have a player called itsme.be onboarding over 60,000 people every month, which is a fully commercial consortium of banks, telcos, and Microsoft as a strong enabler. And if we ask people on the street that are using itsme to, to, to go to and go to their bank to pay taxes to use, if you ask them, do you know this is a first fully commercial uh, set of providers that is, enabled, that are, that is doing this, they will probably say no. And I've asked the question in some meetups and most people actually say, no, I didn't, I didn't know that. I thought this was somehow also still connected with the state. It's no longer true. So this means that we're in a very, very important situation where our national states are signing out, signing away the very thing that they used in the first place to build territory and ask taxes of people to actually build the very notion of who is legal, who is illegal. And this notion is now being signed out to the market. And this is, I think, a very important political moment that we cannot let pass. So the way I see it is sort of, I, I picture the world now as a kind of kitchen and there's sort of two people at the table. 
the governments are still at the table and the corporations are at the table. And we citizens, we're crawling around on the floor in the kitchen. We're standing in the corner. We're sort of wandering about and we have to build the chair. And the way I see it is that SSI, this self-sovereign identity, is a way for us to build the chair, to get ourselves to the table. And then I think the way I see it from what we've been trying to do is to go a step further and to say from this self-sovereign identity, you as a person, as a citizen, should be able to have thousands of identities specifically only for one service. For example, I rent a house, I pay the energy company. The energy company just needs, just needs one credential or one smart contract or one disposable identity that says I can pay. And this is number 28. And then if I don't pay through the number 28, they could actually find me or an identity that was there or that, and that didn't pay. As long as I pay, all the energy company needs to know is not, it's nothing about me. They just need to get the money for the energy. So that, that's it. So this is the way I think we have to start breaking down our relationships with service providers as people across the world. Not because we would simply want to do this now, because we have no other way. If we do not do this, we will either end up, as we are already, in a fully surveillance paradigm, either by states or by commercial companies. And again, being now in this kind of internet of things environment is very, really important, is very invisible. People are not seeing that there is no longer an analog world. It's no longer simply a car. It's no longer simply your washing machine. It's no longer simply your lamp. Everything is infused with this type of connectivity. And so now is the time for people to say, look, this is the moment to take full control of this identity and to do this through this notion of disposable identities so we can all renegotiate each and every transaction that we have with each and every service provider. Now what will probably happen, because not everybody would like that, is that there's custodians coming up, groups of people that will also do this for you. And there I think there's a, an, an, a, an immense amount of, of business opportunities um, I mean, good business opportunities for parties to, um, to make sure that when you lose your private keys that basically control your identity, that technically there's going to be some backup on this, that friends and family, like Jeff was saying, trustees can be part of this kind of way of getting sort of restoring, restoring all of this. And that there's groups in society now that we don't really see as institutions or as particular, comp particular brands that, we, that are a bit behind, but still have trust of people that can become part of this ecosystem to build these uh, custodians. So basically, really, again, I come back to this point of there's a deadly virus. People have, have tools with which they can be tracked and traced and saved, and they don't want to use them because they, they mistrust the companies and the governments more than, than they could actually start trusting that the virus is not going to kill them. So I had a, seen a rather, rather interesting statistic on this Corona tracing apps, uh, which one, the ones which have been already deployed globally. And it was just a question of the user acceptance of these apps. And I can tell you from a global perspective, the distrust is a global distrust. It was even like for Singapore, mm -hmm. It was not the 40%, maybe the people are dreaming of, it was about 27 or something like that. They were below 20, I think, or in below Singapore. 20 or 17 update. or something like yes, that. It so was, it, was, yeah. it was completely no acceptance no. for it. So this really, this really points me to, to thinking, it's nothing, radically that we, it's nothing radical that we're putting out here. It's a big win-win for good governance institutions, for business, for citizens to actually go this way, because it's a new, it will build new value, it will build new forms of transactions, new services. And if we see that, that, that the numbers are sort of like 2080, then why are people still investing energy, resources, money, time in infrastructure that has a 20% acceptance rate, even with a deadly virus around, 
makes no sense to me. And it will start making a lot of sense to a lot of people to move in this other direction and start building value there. So, and Rob, you, you, you had brought this uh, terms of disposable identity now into the discussion. And I would yeah. just hand over to Lorna because I know that you have worked on, on a lot of, let's say, user stories about how disposable identities can support some, some, some uh, users. Yes, uh, the people in life. Can you just uh, tell a little bit more about, you know, what is the core idea about it and, and how can it be used? Yeah, and I think connecting also very much to what you were saying, Rob, I think it's such a powerful insight, um, this level of trust. And one of the things that we're seeing is it, it's not really at this stage an either or. When you start going through the user scenarios, you see that there are actually even some, some apps that are being developed and installed by users that are getting a huge uptake. And one of the noticeable aspects there is that there are they are apps that are enabling trusted human organizations to act better. And I think that's just where we're seeing that actually it's the combination of identity or identities, along with the trust paradigm, how much trust and value, and with the data that's being shared. And so we, if we look, we actually have a mapping of a scale from you know, the extremely high security level possibilities, um, right through to the, what we call the, the incredibly insecure federated Google, Facebook, Apple identities, but on a usability level, you know, they're great, you know, I've got one identity, or if you have the silo versions, I think I look in my passwords, I have at the moment 644. Um, so I, you know, there's clearly a need for multiple identities. Um, and so what we're looking at is how we can bridge between the, you know, idealistic, very secure, um, self-sovereign uh, potential, but with the really fluent usability of, you know, right at the end of the scale, the federated. But so it's, you know, sovereign, federated identity. And that's actually a huge challenge. So we're probably going to be going steps along the way and having something in, the beto in between and taking lessons from the Corona apps, not trying to go for tech solutionism where it's purely technical, but actually looking at organizational. And I think much as Rob was saying there, who are the people, the organizations, maybe family members, maybe you know trusted bodies who have built up trust over time who as part of this ecosystem can enable me to have my 644 identities where I know what's happening with them and where I can actually shut them down, dispose of them as and when I choose. Sounds good. Just sounds good. Um, as, uh, I mean, we are almost at the end. I, I, as I, it's, it's always amazing to see like an hour is, is passing away on, on, on that stuff. I would just give everybody of us the chance to, let's say, the famous last words, hopefully not the last words of your life, but the last words of, of, of this show. Um, and by that, I would like to hand over to Jeff. Just, uh, you know, what is your, what do you see as the biggest outcome? Uh, and um, yeah, Jeff. Well, I'm, I'm going to take a twist on the word trustees, which uh, came together by uh, combining the word trust and buddies. So who are you, the people who you trust your buddies? And who aren't you don't, you don't trust? Yeah, usually people you don't know in the government because they are so abstract. So for me, this is the most important aspect uh, that we untrust much more uh, with people we know simply. And that could be a key to solving these kind of issues that we have with Corona. Um, but also indeed, technically uh, to solve the problem that, yeah, if your life, your identity depends on a, on a piece of cryptography, you better keep it safe. And who you keep it safe are people you trust. I mean, just the people you know. So I keep it simple uh, with that and uh, Maybe one other thing is we, we outsourced way too much intelligence to others. I would rather want to have that intelligence on my for my own our own AI, if you want, our own knowledge, our own candor uh, that uh, works on behalf of us and do not rely too much on the other guys, their stuff. So it's, but that's just me. No, no, no. I like the idea of simplifying their own supply chain towards trust and identity. And by that, uh, I will hand over to Lola for uh, your hey. final statement. 
Well, I think actually one of the the great experiences of you know of working together with these guys the last while, and particularly with the strong, um, quite large UX um, community that we have, is it's um, meeting in the middle between the technology and the users' world. Um, this is the key, and it's not what we've seen with a lot of the the very fast solution to the Corona issue is the tech solutions and where everything's taken out of the hands of people. So we to meet and give more, um, you know, identity, but also ability and enabling to the individuals and to groups, and also use the technology in a way to support that, not replace it. Yeah, cool. So, Rob, uh, you, the pleasure is towards you to to have the final the final statement. Well, then, then I will say that um, the beauty of the situation of what we're proposing is that it's fully compliant with um, European legislation, especially the GDPR. And there's a lot of people in the IoT community, and uh, me included, um, who, were, who were there when it sort of started about 10 years ago, were quite skeptic of this kind of legal way of, of doing things. Um, it now turns out that we can hard code it. And that's basically what we're doing. So we're not doing much more than taking current legislation, European legislation, GDPR, that says that um, data flows and data streams and, and transactions of data should be limited in time, should be limited in scope, should be purpose only. And we're doing nothing more than making this provable and to prove that this is, that this is happening. So that's, I think, the beauty of the situation. Uh, and that's also why I think that um, what we're doing will be very successful because it's, it's aligned, not just politically, economically, but also, as we, as we hear now, psychology, in a sociological view and in a psychological way with how people want to be seen and how they want to behave and how they want their identities and data to be, um, to be working for them. Um, and to be played back scenarios uh, to them that could um, put them in a better position. So I think, uh, yeah, this is just, um, it's just, just a no brainer. It sounds like the beginning of an awesome story. Lorna, you have to leave for another meeting. I so, do, thank you yes, very so much. Let's say uh, thanks for, for being there. And thank yes, you enjoy me. your new normal, uh, virtual meetings, whatever, uh, like we do yes. half of our life now. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Thank you. Bye. Uh, hello now. Just for the show notes, we have talked a lot, a lot about disposable identity. So if you, if you would like to get a little bit more information about disposable identities, it will be in the show notes uh, for the video. And you can go to disposableidentities.eu. And there's a website with all the information about uh, the concepts, the people who are working on and the roadmaps and a lot of, uh, let's say, the, the big uh, picture in behind. Um, if you like the show and if you like, uh, uh, yes, our, our stream and our video, just uh, subscribe. Uh, that's easy or share it on social media. And by that, I just a big thank you to you all. Like, Jeff, Lorna, she already gone. Rob, uh, thanks. This was really a, a great, great hour to talk with you. Thanks. Thanks, Mirko. Thanks, Mirko. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>